Hey, welcome into the Stinking Truth Podcast. Mark Schlerth alongside Mike Evans. Thank you so much for downloading, listening, liking, doing all the things you do. Please share with your friends. Uh, if you like it, if you don't like it, don't tell anybody. Just keep your mouth shut. That's our that's a guy code right there. Guy code. Uh, Mike, how are you, buddy? I'm good. No hijinks. Okay, let's get right to it. Okay. Don't take this podcast off the rails. Okay, I got a lot of I got a lot of stuff to do today. Okay. Okay. We got a lot of ground to cover. All right. So let's get no to tomfoolery, it. no hijinks. No, no duly shenan- noted. No shenanigans. Okay. Okay. Lamar Jackson at uh, Ravens OTA talking about the new offense. Really excited about it. Says it's going to be less running, more throwing. Yeah, well, I mean, that's exactly what you did, right? That's why you went out and got Todd Munkin. If you look at his career, you know, especially when he was Tampa Bay, I mean, they would just throw that living snot out of the football. So that's what they did. Uh, They went out, they got, they drafted, I believe, a wide receiver. They went out and got Odell Beckham Jr., right? So they're trying to make that move. But I've said this for a while. Um, I talked to you about all the tight ends and how they had multiple running backs and a fullback that was 313 pounds and and the way their offense operated. And it was a run first, run second, third down and six is a potential running down type of offense. And so all of a sudden what you're going to do is say, okay, we're going to take that element out of our offense and Lamar, you're going to lead us you know, to the promised land. You're going to lead us in a situation in which we're going to get a lot more diverse coverages, a lot more, you know, a lot different looks, a lot of instead of guys blitzing or having eight men or nine men in the box all the time, now we're going to have seven guys drop and we're going to have eight guys dropping into coverage. Like you're going to have to make tight window throws. You're going to have to make, you know, multiple leveled throws. So, you know, when I think about a, a, a level throw, I'm talking about um, I'm talking about touch passes, you know, over a linebacker in front of a safety. Uh, those type of those type of throws that are a little bit more nuanced. Uh, some things that, you know, frankly, with the offense and the style of the offense they used to run, he didn't see a lot of that stuff or didn't have to do a lot of that stuff. So you're asking him to basically lead you from a more traditional drop back kind of kind of offense and it'll be interesting to see if he can do it I, like i have my doubts like i think a lot of people in this league a lot of people that cover this league have their doubts we'll see five years in the nfl for lamar jackson he's only thrown for more than three thousand yards once and that was 3100 yards right and his his high for touchdown passes his mvp season he threw for 36 but since then 26 16 and 17 grant he's had some some injuries along the way but uh, 3,100 yards is the highest passing season yardage for Lamar Jackson in a league where passing numbers are on steroids right now. Yeah, which is which is incredible. And then the other thing that goes to show you, you know, the 36 touchdowns, I mean, a lot of that is because you ran the ball so incredibly. You were so efficient running the football that you're always getting one-on-one situation. You're always getting man-to-man coverage. You're always getting, you know, easy access throws to the outside. So yeah, I'm, I'm just telling you. You know, I know everybody was hooping and hollering for this, and everybody was hoping, and everybody was like, oh, you know, it's uh, it's collusion, it's this, it's that. Like, here's the great thing. We're going to find We're out. We're going to find out. We're going to find out. No more excuses, right? The argument's no. always been for Lamar, for his fans, and for his for yeah. Lamar himself. Haven't had the offense. I haven't had the, the weapons. Okay, right. now you got both. What do you got? Yeah, we're gonna see exactly how that pans out, and and I'm you like I'm really happy. I'm I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see what he does, but I'm happy because at least it'll be answered. Now I'm you know the the hardcore fans, you know how they are. They'll make some excuses. Well, John Harbaugh doesn't know what he's doing, and you know, but but we're gonna we're gonna find out, and that that's cool to me. All right, so we watch we watch how that plays out. The Patriots have been docked. <laughs> Two days of organized team activity practices after it was found shocking that they violated off-season rules. Now, what the rule violation was has not been immediately disclosed. It's it's not unusual to see teams get, get docked OTA uh, practices just last off-season alone. The Cowboys, Bears, Commanders, and yeah. Texans were all penalized. And in, back in uh, 2021, Cowboys again, 49ers and Jaguars were uh, were were penalized. But my, my question is, in order for this to come to light, that you get docked like this, penalized like this, mm. doesn't somebody from within the building have to kind of blow the whistle? Yeah, yeah. Or, um, 
Yeah, I, I think it's got to be one of your player reps. Mm-hmm. So we did something that we weren't supposed to do. You know, we were too physical or we had an extra meeting or we, you know, whatever, whatever the You're case. You're saying with a little bit of uh, dripping with a little bit of snark there. Well, I mean, that, you know, I'm, I, listen, is it any doubt that uh, or any, any surprise that the Cowboys constantly have somebody, you know, turning in violations and can't win jack? Like, no. Um I, listen, man, I understand. Like, I understand that the rules are to protect the players, and I understand that you know you can't get in there and do full one on ones and other things of of that nature. But eh, there is that is one of those kind of raise your eyebrows when guys are complaining or teams are complaining, and that's why you know the that's why coaching staffs and organizations hate the clubhouse lawyer type guy, like that guy. You better be a damn good player if you're a clubhouse lawyer because they are looking to get rid of you. If you're the guy that's turning people in and holding everybody accountable when it comes to the organization, you you damn well better be one of the best players ever. Yeah, because I would think that if it came from a player, right? If if a player blew the whistle, yeah, people are going to know who it well, was, okay. right? So I, I would tell you this. like, Think about what happened here just recently in Denver. Okay, okay? I know where you're going. All right, so... Brandon McManus just just was it yesterday? Brandon McManus, who's been As we're a, talking less than forty eight hours ago, right? Yeah, who's been a very good kicker. Who's been a is he a Pro Bowl? Has he been a Pro Bowl kicker? He's been a Pro Bowl kicker, right? Yeah, Pro One Bowl of the top ten highest paid kickers in the NFL. Yeah, all of a sudden the Broncos just said, "Hey, you're gone. See ya. Hope it works out for you." Now he just subsequently signed with the Jacksonville Jaguars, but he's been that good. Last year had a little bit of an off year, but he's been that good. So you know, you start to you start to kind of meet out the the reasons, right? And you look at, okay, he had an off year last year. He was ranked 28th of 34 kickers when it comes to kicking the ball inside, 50 and inside. That's where he was ranked. So he had an off season, an off year last year, okay? All right, there, a lot of guys have off years, okay? But he's been really very good, and he's the last link, the last player to be a part of that Super Bowl 50 team. So then you say, okay, the, well, that's part of it. Then their salary is a top paid, you know, top 10 paid kicker. I think he's number eighth overall as far as kickers are concerned. Do I want that lack of production with a top paid player? And the answer is probably no. So you make that move. But the bottom line, he's been a team captain and he's been, you know, he's been the player rep here for a long time. And when you're trying to change the culture of an organization and you get a guy who is that quote unquote clubhouse lawyer that all of a sudden has, a little bit of an off year, man, organizations can't wait to get rid of you. Send a message. Hey, dude, you've been here throughout these last however many years, and we've been awful. And you've been a team captain, and we've been awful. And you're the clubhouse lawyer, and we've been awful. And does it send a message that permeates that locker room? Does it reverberate through the locker room? And I would tell you, yeah, it does. And I I told you this a while ago when Sean Payton was signed to be the head coach of the Broncos. And I said, there's two types of fear in the NFL. There's that that biblical type of fear, which means awesome reverence, and you know, and, and he's got that. But there has got to be the fear of consequence. There has got to be, this dude is in charge, and he don't play. And that's one of those things that I thought was going to be a dramatic change from what they have had here the last few years, where nobody was truly empowered. Vance Joseph wasn't allowed to pick his own staff. You know, Vic Fangio didn't care what the defense was doing. He just wanted all, he just, I mean, excuse me, what the offense was doing. He just cared about the defense. And obviously, you know, Nathaniel Hackett, (laughs) you know, I mean, I love Nate, but man, this was a absolute Krusty the Clown show. So now all of a sudden you've got an adult running the organization, as you call them, certified pre-owned coaches running the organization. It 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 does it it, it will it will reverberate through that locker room. Well, speaking of Sean Payton and the uh, the Broncos, he's trying to resuscitate, rejuvenate, re-energize all kinds of re's there when it comes to to Russell Wilson's career. Boy, Russell Wilson, if he didn't <laughs> if he didn't need any more motivation. <laughs> How about this? The Seattle Seahawks, less than what? One, I mean, a little over one year after trading Russell Wilson, uh-huh. after nine Pro Bowl years, 
all kinds of franchise records, right. win a Super Bowl, go to another Super Bowl, be the face of your franchise. You trade him, and you give away his number three to Artie Burns. Good player. <laughs> Artie. You know, good veteran, but right. still. Artie yeah. Burns. Artie Burns. So not only can he play cornerback for you, it sounds like you can do your taxes. <laughs> Artie Burns, right? Like, hey, hey, Artie, I'm having a real issue with it. Hey, come on down. Yeah. Now we're going to have to extend you, you know? <laughs> hey, File for an extension. Hey, hey, Artie Burns here. I'm going to have to uh, extend your taxes here. <laughs> Found a few more loopholes here. Yeah, we're talking about FIFO and FILO. <laughs> um, <laughs> he, he what, does, what, I mean, what is that? Is that a... Dude, that is like... There's part of me that says, man, that level of snark I respect, right? right? And then there's part of me that's going, okay, you guys are piling on now, right? You're just being the ultimate dicks. Um, how much, honestly, from an organizational standpoint, on a scale of 1 to 10, the level of hatred <sighs> the Seattle Seahawks have for Russell Wilson will start at 11 plus? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean... Seriously, how much do they dislike him? But you know what? It, well, it must be a lot because to me, this is this is a dick move. It's a dick move. It just is. You're talking about somebody who look. You won. You're the Seahawks. You won. Yeah. You moved on from Russ. You chose Pete Carroll over Russ. You traded Russ. You got a haul for Russ. Geno Smith stepped in, took you to the playoffs. You won, okay? I mean, the the, the, the fight's over. It's a knockout. Right. Okay, throw the damn towel. Yeah, I mean, right. All that kind of stuff, right? Yeah. And yet, you're still looking to drive, you know, the stake in deeper. I I, I mean, you're right. I'm Part of me is like, wow, that is next level dickery, but... <laughs> I don't, but I do think it's too much. I do. Yeah, it it does it does feel a little bit piling on. But again, I, I just think it goes to show you, um, and and I do respect the level of snark from Pete Carroll because there, you know, for a guy who acts like it was no big deal and everything is hunky dory, uh, you know, he holds a grudge. But if you're Russ, man, oh man. Dude, you have got to, you. You should have a a, a Mount Rushmore size chip on your shoulder after a year in which you were mocked by national media. You were mocked by current NFL players, ex NFL players. Teams took shots at you with their their marketing programs, and, and now this. I, yeah. I mean, how much more motivation guys could you possibly the, have? Right, guys on the plane, yeah, flying home from victories were. That's right. I right. mean, it was. I mean, it was, it was un, It was unbelievable. Yeah. If you if you can't be motivated by the lack of respect that you've been shown, um, boy, oh boy. I mean, then there's nothing that can motivate you. Right. So, I mean, I would have to think that Russ and and you know, and I I have great hopes for Russ. You know, having a bounce back season here. Um, a great fo a great hope on on the narrowing narrowing of his focus, you know, and being f much more myopic in his in his vision toward what he needs to accomplish, and and I do believe that Sean Payton will give him that kind of uh, that kind of honed in vision, if you will. It, but you've gotten to know Russ over the years. Is he that type of guy? Is because we've gotten to know him over the last year, and t to me, it's cue up the. Cue up the song. Everything is awesome when it when it comes to Russ. Yeah. Is he the kind of guy that will be driven by revenge? You know, is that the kind of guy that can go to that right. place where it's like I'm gonna show them? Right. I I do believe you don't get to the level of success that that Russ has had if you don't have some of that in you. Um. I, and I believe this about Russ. Like, hey, man, the guy's an exceptionally hard worker, and he's, he's I, I called it toxic positivity. You know, he's just so positive. It's just the point where I think that's what rubs a lot of guys wrong. Like, dude, just be, for once in your life, just be real. Just be a real human. Um, so I think all that stuff is, is, is part of it. I think he's lost some mentors in his life. And that, I think that's been, there's been a, a process there of going through that. And I think one thing I know about Sean is um, one thing I know about Sean Payton is you. We used to say this all the time. My my 
old offensive line coach Alex Gibbs used to say it all the time, and I've adopted this philosophy. There is no virgin meat on my ass. It has all been chewed. And one thing about Sean, there's nobody above reproach. He will he will be in your grill, whether you're a coach, whether you're a player, whether you're you know the equipment staff, whether you're a trainer. Um, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, there will be a consequence for that, and that includes Russell Wilson. So there will be a level of accountability in this organization that hasn't existed in seven years. And he'll hold Russ to that, you know, to that level. So I think you'll see a dramatic improvement based upon Russ being held accountable and the fact that they're gonna, you know, they're gonna offensively, they're gonna there's old Neil McCoy, you like country music, the old Neil McCoy had a song called Small Up and Simple Down. They will small this thing up and simple it down and make it, you know, QB friendly for us. Meanwhile, in New York, Jets fans going gaga over all the video that they're watching from OTA and I don't blame them. Aaron Rodgers doing, you know, skipping along and mm-hmm. throwing the football. Hair looks wonderful, yeah. by the way, but he uh, strained a calf. Oh, nothing to see here. Hey, don't worry. Mm-hmm. Guys in his late thirties straining a calf and doing calisthenics, right. nothing to see here. Um, but he he acknowledged, he talked about getting into that New York state of mind and, and what playing in New York is all about and what it would mean to win a championship in New York. He said, look, winning a championship anywhere is, is special. He goes, but I'm, I'm already understanding. He watched the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary on the Mets winning the World Series in 1986. It's just to kind of get a sense of how New York reacts to something like that. Mm-hmm. And he said, man, it doesn't take long to be here to understand what winning a Super Bowl for the Jets would mean for this city, for this fan base. Yeah. And I think he's already, I mean, he's already, uh, you, you're in New York, and I go to New York every now and again to do some TV for Fox, and just the overall vibe and the overall excitement of Aaron Rodgers being in New York is huge because they think, and rightfully so, they think they've got a young, talented team that just needed some direction and a quarterback that could lead them somewhere. So I think that's a big thing. I think the other thing that has gone kind of unsaid, so this weekend I, I spent some time um, chopping it up with uh, with Joe Namath, and we just off the like just kind of off the beaten path. We're just back in the green room having dinner together and and just kind of chopping it up. And somebody asked him about you know if Aaron Rodgers would have asked you for the number twelve jersey. And he's like, of course, you know. I'm like, all right, well, it's retired, but you know, if you want to wear it, kind of like a Kelly Trapuca, uh, Peyton Manning thing here in Denver, right? His number 18 was retired, and um, and Peyton reached out to the Tropica family and said, hey, do you mind if I wear 18? And they said, absolutely, and now they're kind of retired together. I'm going to give Aaron Rodgers a ton of props. He was just like, man, I don't, I don't even want to ask. I don't want to I – don't, I don't want – like, I don't want that pressure. I don't want that. I don't, I, no, I'm going to go back to my college number, number eight. And one, you took a, you took a ton of pressure off of – Mont, or excuse me, off of uh, Joe Namath. Yeah. What's Joe Namath going to say? Right. No, no, right. no, you can't have right. it. So you, you, you took that off his plate, which is, I think, really cool and very thoughtful of Aaron Rodgers. And you get kind of start anew with your new team and your new franchise. And I just, I think it, it's not something that a lot of people have talked about, but I think it's something kind of cool um, and a way to kind of establish yourself coming into a new organization. But hey, man, I'm not some prima donna. We're in this thing together, and I think that's I think that's awesome. You ready for kind of like a little lightning round, bounce around some more topics? Okay, like I said, sure. the NFL, three hundred sixty-five day a year beast that needs to be fed, and there's a, yeah. no shortage of stories. The new fair catch rule. Love to get your thoughts on that. The new rule specifies that the fair catch of a free kick of a kickoff uh, must occur behind the team's twenty-five yard line in order for the ball to be placed at the twenty-five. So we know that if you if a ball is a touchback, mm. it automatically goes out to the twenty-five. Well, now if the ball is kicked short, and let's say you come out to the the five or the ten mm. and, and get ready to field it, if you call a fair catch, catch the ball, ball immediately goes out to the twenty-five. Right. Which the is I- different. The old rule, well, you could fair catch it anywhere. You could fair well, catch yes, it in play, could. but you're going to get it if you fair catch it at the twelve. Yeah, you get it at the twelve. Correct. Okay. Correct. But this way, it immediately goes out to the 25. The idea behind it is that it will help 
reduce concussions. The uh, modeling that the NFL has done says that the kickoff return rate will decrease from 38 to 31 percent, but that the concussion rate will drop 15 percent mm-hmm. due to this. No surprise, special team coaches unanimously voted against it. Sure. How do you feel about it? Uh, I would vote against it as well. We wouldn't have the greatest comeback in history or one of the greatest comebacks in history in that Kansas City-Buffalo game if, um, like, like one, if in that game, Buffalo kicks it out of bounds, right? So that so they don't mortar kick it. They kick it out of bounds so Kansas City doesn't have to return it. They get the ball in 20, 13 seconds left. They come back and, and they tie that game up. Correct? Isn't that kind of – am I paraphrasing that correctly, how that happened? Um, if you're allowed to mortar kick that, no time – come, or you're allowed to fair catch that, if you kick it down to the five, which should have happened, so you're automatically going to eat up five seconds. You're probably going to have the ball behind the 20-yard line, behind the 25-yard line, excuse me. And, um, and ultimately, you're not going to get that extra field position and you're not – you're going to – not going to eat up that time. So if you fair catch it, bam, you catch it. No time comes off the clock. You get it at the 25. It takes away a strategic move. And it takes away a strategic move uh, in football in where if you think you have an advantage, like a team's not a great return team or a guy's got greasy fingers, Mm -hmm. and you make them return it, you mortar kick it or you do whatever, you make them return it, um, again, that's, that's one of those strategic moves. Now, you can't fair kick if you squib kick it. You can't fair catch it, right? So that's I'm, I'm sure that's how they get around the rule. But I, I like I'm with special teams coaches, man. It's part of the game. Injuries also, unfortunately, are part of the game. Um, I, I don't want to make the game unrecognizable. And you know, I know it hasn't hurt anything as of yet. And I know I'm a little bit old school on some of that stuff. But um, I, I like that strategy. I, I don't want to lose that part of it. Uh, that part of the game. Do you uh, see Austin Eckler after some issues with the Chargers mm-hmm. over uh, over a new contract and the possibility of uh, being moved? They they agree to a, a new contract and include some two million dollars in incentives. Uh, Austin Eckler, I, boy, I, what were the Chargers? Why 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 mess around with this guy? He's your best offensive player outside yeah. of Herbert. Yeah, um, because you can. Because you don't need to pay running backs anymore. Because, like, I don't know. I mean, it's it's. But do you part- think of Austin Eckler as that? Do you think of him as a running back, like Ezekiel Elliott, right. running back? Say, I, I, yeah. I mean, I know that the, all these running backs now are dual threats to some degree. But isn't Eckler almost in a Christian McCaffrey class of his of his own? Yeah, but Christian McCaffrey's been hurt a bunch yeah, over true. the last few Good years. I, I just think. Anytime you touch the ball in those situations, those guys don't step out of bounds. Those guys, you know, they're not touching the ball 18 yards down the football field. You know, they're passing their route tree is not running a dig and catching it, you know, in front of a in front of a, a safety. Um, you know, it's it, you're catching the ball on swing passes. You're catching the ball in traffic. You're doing those things as a running back. Um, and it's not just it's not just the the carrying of the football. It's the touches of the football. And the fact that when you do go down, you're going down with four or five guys on top of you. So I, I just, again, it's it's one of those it's one of those positions where if you're a kid nowadays, growing up, where everybody wanted to be a running back when you and I were growing up, now everybody wants to be a wide receiver. Nobody wants to play running back anymore. Like it's just one of those positions that um, I think, for the most part, is thankless, and uh, it's become one of those positions that's been fungible in that and that you you want to have two or three different guys that are touching the ball that do different things I, it just is it's just different than it used to be and it's not as it's just not as valuable as it once was seeing as how you feel about snark you like good snark yeah you'll love this but but give him credit for face-to-face honesty okay. so roth ben roethlisberger uh recently hosted kenny pickett on his podcast footballing with ben roethlisberger mm-hmm. and he said to Pickett, he said, quote, 
I'll be completely honest. I'll be super transparent here. I'm going to get blasted. I probably shouldn't say this, but who cares at this point? I wouldn't say that I wanted Kenny to necessarily fail, but when someone comes to replace you, I still feel like I had it. I hope he doesn't come ball out because then it's like Ben who? He continued telling Pickett, quote, early on, I didn't want you to succeed because you followed me up. I didn't want to happen. I think that's probably the selfishness of me, and I feel bad for it. I appreciate the honesty. I think there's, I mean, I think that, you know, I've had this conversation with, with a lot of, well, with a bunch of quarterbacks. And I think, you know, that that competitiveness and, and you know, that the understanding of you become the guy. And, man, I'll tell you what, it's like you're the man. And Ben was the man there forever. Um, I, I always say this. And it's what I love about sports and it's why it's hard to win a championship is because it takes such a special group of people in any sport to be able to put aside selfishness, to put us put aside your own, you know, individualism and individual accolades and the things you want to accomplish and be a team first person. You know, it, I mean, it's life in general, right? To have that spirit of servantship is that if servantship's a word is close enough if, whether it is servitude uh service spirit of service you're Can famous for making up words okay. don't worry about all it all right so to, to have to have that about you and other than raising your own kids there are very few times in life when you can celebrate somebody else's success like it's your own and that happens in sports probably doesn't happen often enough and it's probably why it's really hard to win a championship when you have that as part of your team where, and I tell this story all the time, we're, we're playing the Raiders back in our back-to-back championship runs here in, in Denver. And we have Mike Anderson in the backfield. One of the, I think it was Mike. Uh, maybe it was the year after our championship. Maybe it was the year after anyhow, but it was during that, during that time frame, And, um, Mike Anderson breaks one. I think it was Mike. I could be wrong on that. But somebody, one of our running backs broke one down the sideline, right? And they're just going to town, right? They're just, and all of a sudden we're, we're, you know, 30 yards down the field or whatever. And uh, it was a nose guard named Grady Jackson for the Raiders. Um, Big 330 pound, you know, just behemoth. And he's trailing the play, you know, and it gets down toward the sideline. And here's Rod Smith, our ex receiver, right? So he's on the opposite side. We run strong, like 19 handoffs strong. And so it's going down the left hand sideline. And Rod Smith, our ex receiver, comes looping around. And here's big lumbering 330 pound Grady Jackson chasing the ball. All of a sudden, Rod just boom and just ass over tea kettle, right? This 330 pound guy boom just gets blown up. So the next day, we're in, we're in the locker room. And, um, and when we won, and we, you know, we beat the Raiders you every time we freaked them. 11 and 1 against the 11 Raiders? 11 and 1 against their punk asses. Uh, I digress. So, anyhow, um, we, we, get, we can go in the, and lift and run and do our own thing, and then we can go watch the film. So, all us offensive linemen say, okay, what time are we coming in? Da, 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 let's, let's watch the film. So, we'd all watch the film together and read our grade sheets where Alex Gibbs is just ripping us and stuff. You know, it was, <laughs> it was fun, it was like a little thing. So anyhow, we come bebopping out of the locker room or out of the, our, our offensive line meeting room. And Rod is like literally waiting for us to come because he knows we're in there, right? And he's like, did you see it? Did you see it? And we're like, what? He goes, did you see my block on Grady? Did you see my block on Grady? And like in that particular game, he probably had seven catches for 120 yeah, yeah, yards yeah. and you know, and yeah. a touchdown. He couldn't care less about the stats he put up. He was so excited about being like an honorary lineman, yeah. right? Like he got that block and sprung our guy for an extra, you know, 20 or whatever it was. And to have that kind of that kind of excitement, you know, for for us collectively and what we're doing, like that is that is special. And it takes it it takes you know, a real honest and you know, like Ben Roethlisberger, I appreciate the honesty. But why, why feel that way in the first place, though? You're you're Ben freaking Roethlisberger, and and it's it's amazing <sighs> because you think about some of these quarterbacks, who 
they're Hall of Famers. They're all time mm-hmm. greats, and yet they're like, yeah, I don't want to help this guy. He's here to you know take my job, or I don't want Jimmy right. Garoppolo around here. Get him out of here. That kind of thing. It, it 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 it's almost like here are these alpha dogs, these great players. No, they're insecure, Mike. Right? Why the why the insecurity? Why? Um, I you know what? You're the I, man, what are you insecure? Why are you worried about Kenny freaking Pickett? Yeah, I don't know. I I don't know. And I've talked to quarterbacks who say it's probably more prevalent for us than it is for for other people. And, and maybe like the guys I've talked to, it, it's only several, but the guys I've talked to have said that. Like I always I always said in my own career, I was like, I'm going to teach you everything I can. You, I'm an open book. You can ask me anything. I want to teach you everything else because I'm so confident in what I'm doing that you're not going to. You, you can't take my job. Right. You'll never be better than me. Real quick, tell right? the tell the Montana front side back side. Oh yeah yeah yeah. 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 So this was this is and this is kind of how progressions are run and this is i'm paraphrasing this but you know mike shannon's a good friend and and it was about it was about joe montana versus steve young yeah and steve young goes to mike and you know when you think about progressions in in an nfl system so you're thinking about okay front side if i got three wide receivers on the front side right i'm going um you know, I'm going, we're running somebody off on the backside, right? We're running the X off, and if I've got the tight end, he's running a through. And, you know, and the, the slot receiver, the F, is running a pick curl. And, you know, and the and the guy, so he's about 12 yards on a pick curl, and the, and the Z is running, um, you know, a, a, just a now or a shallow, you know, crosser, right? And so you're going one, two, three, and your backside throw is, is four, right? And or if it's a two by two formation, you know, you're running a combination of, of double slants on one side, right, with a with a curl flat on the other side. So going through for, your progression. Right? So you go one, two, yep. that's not open, I'm getting to three, right, right? right? So that's how it goes. So you're going front side, one, two, three, you know, four, right. one, two, three, right. one, two, three, four, right? right? Right. And so so Steve was like, I'll be damned, like, like Montana gets through it like that. Like he gets the backside like that. Like how does he? How can you possibly read through it that fast? Like he's beaten me to the backside by literally a second and a half, and he's never getting hit, and I'm always under pressure. And like, how's he doing it? And so he's asking Mike, and Mike goes, "I don't like. Let me ask him." And so he goes to Joe and goes, "Hey man, let me ask you that." And he goes, "No, I'm not gonna tell you." He goes, "What do you mean?" He goes, "You're gonna give it to Steve. I'm not telling you." You gotta figure it out on his own. Like he's not. <laughs> this I'm is like, Joe Montana. Right. I'm not like no. Right. Right. And and so then Joe was like, Joe was like, I don't really read progressions. I just go front side to back side. If I see a coverage that basically locks up my throw on the front side, I automatically get to the back side. So I'm not really going one, two, three. I'm going concept, boom. Or concept, boom. Right? And, and so the great ones, to me, the guys that just are amazing have the ability to see everything, right? They just see it and instantly know. That's not a good look for me. Bam, I'm getting to the back side. And, you know, they, they know by based on, hey, what I get in the front side, what the likelihood I'm going to get on the back side. You know, so a lot of the route combinations are, okay, on the front side, we got a, a zone beater on the backside. We got a man beater. And so if I know, hey, man, I got, you know, I got man on the front side on this zone throw, I'm getting to the backside right now. And so that's kind of how it how it operates or how that, you know, and I'm no quarterback. But even though I'm but no even, quarterback. But, 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 but it's Joe Montana. And it's like even, you know, he knows that he's seeing things that other people aren't seeing. Right. But he's still not going to share his secrets. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and I love, I love I Joe, mean, and hot, I, yeah. you know, I love, I those guys are, those guys are both Steve. I work with Steve forever. I've known Joe for a long time. They're both, you know, wonderful humans. But that competitiveness, yeah. right? I and just, insecurity, right? I, that yeah. competitiveness, that insecurity. And he knew ultimately he was right. Ultimately, yeah. they moved on yeah. from him. Yeah. Ultimately, they they replaced because that's how NFL teams operate. You know the you know the business of it. Anyhow, kind of cool stuff, man. Like it. Yeah. All right. For everybody involved in the Sync Truth Podcast, we appreciate you guys so much. And uh, we'll be back with you uh, next week.